Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you. Presiding officer, it, it may be the, that partisan rough and tumble is the stuff that excite, excites some of the parliamentary sketch writers, but I believe there is a huge and understandable public appetite for detailed information on the coronavirus and the measures being taken to deal with it. First Minister, in the past week, public concern on coronavirus has inevitably increased with statements from and actions initiated by the United States, Italy, and in the last hour, the Republic of Ireland, amongst others. In consequence, there is much speculation about how our governments respond, about when it is right to move from the containment phase to delay, and whether and when it is right to move to more radical measures of social distancing, such as shutting schools or cancelling events. The public are worried they need reassurance. Can the First Minister give us some sense of when the Scottish Government expects to move to the next phase of its response, and if she cannot tell us exactly when we might expect more comprehensive measures, can she at least give us some sense of how the decision will be made and how the government will judge when it is the right moment to take wider action? First Minister. Well, can I thank Jackson Carlow for uh, his questions? Um, and I agree with him. I think the public uh, do want to have as much information on this situation as possible. Um, the daily update of our numbers of confirmed cases will be published at 2 o'clock today as normal after the process of checks and verification that is essential. So I'm not able uh, right now to give uh, the precise number, but I can uh, tell Parliament that we will see a sharp rise in cases reported today and we may also see further evidence of community transmission of coronavirus. Uh, that underlines uh, the seriousness of the situation we are all facing. Uh, the Health Secretary and I and our Chief Medical Officer will participate in the COBRA meeting that the Prime Minister will chair early this afternoon. Um, amongst uh, the issues for discussion there will be the move from the contained phase to the delay phase. My view is the time is now right to do that, and I would expect uh, that the four UK nations will uh, reach an agreement on that this afternoon. Uh, that, if that is the decision that is taken this afternoon, will of course necessitate new guidance uh, to the public, setting out clearly what we expect them to do uh, now, most likely from the start of next week, and I'm happy to go into further detail about that if Jackson Carlow wishes me to do so. Uh, in addition to that, the Health Secretary and I have been considering what further actions we require to take uh, particularly to protect the resilience of our frontline emergency workers. Um, and that does involve our position on mass gatherings. Um, and again, I'm happy to go into detail about what uh, we are minded uh, to advise from the start of next week on that issue as well. Uh, this is a serious situation. There is no doubt that we will be asking people to change the way uh, they live their normal lives for a period. Um, but people must understand the purpose of that is not to uh, take away uh, this challenge because unfortunately we are not able to do that, but it is to seek to manage it in a way that delays the spread, reduces the peak impact, which is important for our National Health Service, and crucially uh, to take action that will, as best we can, protect those that we know are most susceptible to developing serious illness. Uh, so these are the steps we will take, and there'll be a number of issues there that Jackson Carlow will wish, uh, I'm sure, for me to go into further detail on. Jackson Carlow. I thank the, uh, the First Minister for, for that comprehensive response. Indeed, I think that we are at a, a phase where a lot of us are receiving uh, requests for advice and guidance on events that are currently planned, and, and whether we think it appropriate for those to proceed or whether people feel that it's safe that they should participate in them. And I think it would be helpful if the First Minister was able to give Parliament some further indication as to the sort of response she thinks that MSPs should be offering when challenged in those matters. First Minister. Well, can I uh, address the issue of mass gatherings uh, directly at the moment? And can I be clear at this stage, of course, I am speaking for the Scottish Government and it is for other administrations to reach their own position, although I will uh, obviously be very interested in the views uh, of other administrations at uh, the COBRA meeting this afternoon. Uh, let me be clear on one thing, and I've said all along that it's important that we uh, are informed by the scientific advice, and I think that continues to be the case. The scientific advice is telling us that cancelling mass gatherings will not in itself have a significant impact on reducing the spread of the virus. Of course, that does not mean it will have no uh, impact on that. But the uh, view that the Health Secretary and I have come to is that there are wider issues to take account of here. 
Uh, mass gatherings require to be policed. They require to have emergency ambulance cover. They require the services of our voluntary uh, health services. And at a time when we need to be reducing the pressures on these frontline workers in order to free them up to focus on the significant challenge that lies ahead, I, I do think it is inappropriate that we continue as normal. Uh, so the Health Secretary and I this morning have decided that we are uh, certainly minded, and this is a, a decision we will seek views on from uh, others at COBRA, but we are minded uh, now that we will advise the cancellation, uh, also from the start of next week, of mass gatherings of 500 people or more. Uh, and that is principally to protect the resilience of our frontline workers. Um, and we will continue to take other uh, decisions in uh, collaboration with the other nations of the UK around uh, issues like schools uh, in the future, but driven very much by the scientific advice. Jackson Carlo. Um, again, I thank the First Minister for that response. And um, gatherings of 500 or more, there, there obviously will be schools and university campuses with uh, cohorts of uh, people present. Uh, who would meet that threshold uh, and I imagine there will be an instant uh, question in the minds of many other organizations as to what the implication of uh, that recommendation would actually be which of course we would support so it'd be helpful to have an understanding of that uh, also I mean concerned with the resilience of our frontline NHS the Chancellor announced measures yesterday I'm sure the First Minister will confirm that any consequentials coming for that and any monies besides that that are required will be going directly to our NHS. Um, there has also been some concern expressed by GPs who have also taken to social media about the available of the appropriate surgical masks. I just wonder if the First Minister can, in addition, uh, give some indication as to the challenge that there is now to a particular NHS supplies and what plans are in place to ensure that these are sustained in the immediate period ahead. First Minister. Well, can I take uh, these issues in turn? Firstly, in terms of what I've just said about mass gatherings, I am talking uh, about events that require policing and, and ambulance uh, cover. Um, and I'm being very clear that this is a, a decision that we are basing um, on resilience issues, uh, not simply on uh, the action that we require to take to reduce the spread of the virus. And I think it is important that we recognise that these decisions uh, have to be informed by the science, but there are wider implications that we all have to be mindful of our emergency services, like all parts of our workforce, are likely to suffer from uh, higher than normal sick sickness absence rates in the weeks and months ahead, and our NHS in particular will be under significant pressure. So it's important that we protect that resilience as much as possible and reduce any unnecessary burden uh, on these frontline workers at this uh, stage. Um, we are not recommending uh, and, and uh, obviously COBRA hasn't met yet, uh, and uh, if this changes at any time, we will uh, advise Parliament. Uh, the advice at the moment is that it would not uh, be the right thing to do to close schools and, and universities at this stage. That is something that has to be kept under constant review, and I, I undertake that we will uh, do that. Uh, finally, on the issue of the budget yesterday, we welcome the announcements that were made specifically around coronavirus. We don't yet, and this, I'm not saying this as a criticism, it's simply a statement of fact, we don't yet have clarity uh, on the allocation of resources to the Scottish Government, but I can give an undertaking uh, that any money that is available for the NHS will go to the NHS, money that is available to support businesses. Uh, the consequentials we get from that, uh, once we know what they are, will go to uh, these purposes. We will do everything we can to mitigate the impact of the situation that we are facing. Uh, lastly, on the very important issues of protective equipment, uh, Health Protection Scotland uh, issued revised guidance yesterday on the equipment required for staff, which is based on clinical and scientific evidence. And we will continue to work to ensure that all services have the resources that they require. Uh, the safety and well-being of our NHS staff is vital at all times, but given uh, what they are facing now, it is particularly important. And if there are any frontline health professionals out there who do not feel they have what they need, they should contact their health board and the Scottish Government will be working closely with health boards to make sure that they have what they need. Jackson Carlo. I thank the First Minister, and of course she's right, this is not just about the NHS, businesses are worried too. Many are viable, they are good businesses, but they know the next few weeks will be tough. And in Scotland we face a further challenge to our key sectors. Many tourism and hospitality businesses will be concerned as we approach the start of their season. The oil price has dropped and this will cast a shadow over the economy of the North East in particular. And many small businesses will be worried about their supply chains and indeed their ability to trade at all. 
Now, the Chancellor has acted to meet the seriousness of the times with radical rates relief and other measures to support the economy. I accept and appreciate the comment the First Minister has just made about being absolutely certain about the consequentials that will be forthcoming. But could she reassure business that it's likely that the Scottish Government will wish to implement complementary plans to those that have been announced for the rest of the United Kingdom economy, uh, pot potentially with some incrementality to reflect particular circumstances affecting the Scottish economy? First Minister. Um, yes, I can give that assurance in general terms. Uh, obviously, the, the structure of our business rate system is already not identical to uh, south of the border, so we will have to make sure it is applicable to the Scottish system. Um, as I said a moment ago, we do not yet have clarity on the quantum of consequentials that will come from the announcements yesterday, but I can give an assurance uh, on the non-domestic rates issue that all of the consequentials that come from the non-domestic rates decisions announced by the Chancellor yesterday will go to supporting businesses uh, here in Scotland and uh, I hope that assurance is welcome. Uh, beyond that uh, we will continue to make sure the money that is available through that route goes to uh, where it is needed uh, but we are also looking as I'm sure Parliament would expect us to do within our own uh, resources uh, how we can provide additional support. Um, one of the things I do think there is still a need to do more on uh, than, than what was done in the budget yesterday is support to individuals uh, who will suffer hardship if they are not able to work and that's something the Scottish Government is looking at. Uh, I, I welcome some of the changes that have been announced uh, around uh, benefit rules and statutory sick pay, but I think there is still a need here uh, for the UK government to do more in that regard. Thank you very much. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, we know that uh, older people and those with underlying health conditions are at the greatest risk from the spread of COVID-19. Many of us are rightly concerned about parents and grandparents, especially those who are being cared for either in their own homes or in residential care. Escalation and additional resourcing of the NHS is without question necessary, but will not be sufficient. So can the First Minister tell us what contingency plans there are to ensure that essential social care services are properly supported. First Minister. Uh, well, can I thank Richard Leonard for raising these important issues as well. Can I uh, say firstly that he is absolutely right to talk about the importance of protecting older people and those with other underlying health conditions. Uh, the focus of the uh, discussions so far, and I'm sure this will be the case at COBRA this afternoon, uh, informed very much by scientific advice, has really in broad terms been twofold. How do we slow down the spread of uh, the virus and reduce the peak impact so that the pressure on our National Health Service is reduced as much as possible when it is at its peak? But secondly, how we uh, protect those who are most at risk of becoming most seriously unwell. The vast majority of people who get this uh, infection will have mild symptoms, but that will not be true for some. Um, and therefore, this afternoon, I am sure there will be a discussion on that latter point and the advice, uh, perhaps not immediately, but over the coming days that will be given to older people and those, uh, particularly those with uh, compromised immune systems. Uh, and, and that is important of those. Of course, patients who have severely compromised immune systems will already have guidance about what to do and, and not to do. And it's important that that is, is followed. Um, the points about social care are also uh, very important. Often when we talk about this thing, these things, often for shorthand, we talk about the National Health Service. That is vital, but the contribution of social care, not just care homes, but social care in the community will be absolutely vital. The Health Secretary has uh, had discussions already with COSLA. COSLA has got a critical uh, part to play here in making sure that those contingency plans are in place and ready to be implemented. And I can assure Richard Leonard that all of those plans uh, with a view to implementation are well advanced and we we will continue to progress them. Richard Leonard. And can I thank the First Minister for that answer? I mean, social care workers are the bedrock not only of our care services, but of our communities. And we know from the Scottish Government's own Fair Work Convention that 83% of this workforce are women. Uh, that more than one in 10 of social care workers are on zero hours contracts that one in five are on temporary contracts and that their average pay is less than £10 an hour. And yet, and yet they are on the front line in the battle with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. So alongside our health service workers, they need our unwavering support. First Minister, following yesterday's budget statement, what additional resources 
does the Scottish Government plan to allocate to social care? And given the complexity of the commissioning and contracting system, how will you ensure that any additional resources find their way through to support and protect those workers who are on the front line? First Minister. Well, can I uh, genuinely try to be as helpful as possible on the resources question here? As, as I've just said to Jackson Carlow, there were helpful announcements made in the budget yesterday. Uh, this is a, a simple statement of fact. We do not yet know uh, the quantum uh, that will come to the Scottish Government, whether for domestic, non-domestic rates, assistance, or indeed for the National Health Service, nor do we know yet uh, the basis on which that funding will be allocated. I hope we get clarity on that soon. And I absolutely give a commitment, uh, firstly, to passing on all of that uh, that is intended for health or social care to health and social care, um, and to being uh, transparent in updating Parliament as soon as we have the detail of that. We will also, of course, we've just set our budget and uh, the budget involved additional resources for health and social care, but we will be looking across our budget at ways in which we need to uh, change what we're doing and how we're doing it to support uh, the, the efforts to uh, deal with this challenge in the, the weeks ahead. Uh, the final point I would make on uh, resources, which relates to the question about commissioning, it will absolutely be the case that we will uh, be allocating additional resources in particular areas and perhaps not using uh, the usual methods of allocating in order to make sure that the money gets exactly where it is needed. Um, finally, on the point about the social care workforce, which I absolutely uh, agree with, um, and the points about zero hours contracts and insecure employment really feed into and underline the comment I made earlier that I think we still need to do more to support individuals who will end up in hardship because of this situation. But in terms of the social care workforce in particular, the discussions we're having and the plans we're looking at do involve uh, very quickly looking at uh, ensuring additional training for that workforce, making sure they have the equipment and any kit that they need to deal with the very different challenges they're going to be uh, dealing with. In, in summary, presiding officer, um, we are going to face a significant challenge in the weeks and months to come. There is no getting away from, from that. Uh, a significant number of us are going to get this infection. You cannot make a virus like this simply go away. Uh, the challenge uh, and our responsibility is to manage that as best we can, uh, doing the things I've already spoken about, giving the right advice to the public and supporting uh, to the best of our ability, those who are on the front line. And I uh, give an assurance to Parliament that that is what I, the Health Secretary, um, and the government as a whole is absolutely focused on. Richard Leonard. And uh, can I thank the First Minister for that commitment as well. Donald McCaskill of Scottish Care reminded us this week that how we treat our older people and how we respond to COVID-19 will say a lot about what kind of society we are. He reflected that social care has been consistently underfunded and that the work of social carers is all too often portrayed as unskilled and of little economic value. He said, and I quote, we need to reset those attitudes if we are not only going to beat the disease, but also beat the attitudes which we are facing. He is right, isn't he? Before coronavirus COVID-19, we have not given sufficient priority to our social care workforce and so to the people they care for. With COVID-19, we now need to reset our priorities as a society. This will also mean a reset of the government's priorities. So will the First Minister agree to that reset today to give us the best chance of dealing with this immediate crisis in the right way? First Minister. Um, I, I'm going to genuinely try and find uh, consensus rather than division in my answers to these questions because I think they are important and I think they are to a very large extent valid. Uh, I, I don't agree uh, that we haven't been prioritising social care. I, I do think there is more to be done there, but through the work we have been doing in integrating health and social care, uh, increasing resources going to social care, shifting the balance from health to social care. That is not work that is completed, but it is work that is ongoing. And I think it is really important that we continue and accelerate that. So, you know, in that sense, I, I would agree uh, with Richard Leonard on uh, the importance of that. In terms of the characterisation that I absolutely accept that 
social care workers often feel is made of them. It's not one I agree with. Uh, these are not low-skilled workers. These are essential workers that, uh, in the best of times, uh, do a really important, valued and valuable job. And in the weeks and months ahead, that will be even uh, more the case. And we need to make sure that they are properly supported. And again, I uh, give an assurance and an undertaking that we will do everything we can to make sure that that is the case. Um, there will, uh, in uh, due course, uh, sooner rather than later, but I, I don't want to preempt the discussions we will have this afternoon, uh, be advice to older people generally about how they uh, should change behaviour in order to protect themselves uh, against this virus. Of course, I think the earliest advice we are going to come uh, see coming in the next uh, few days will be to the general population about the importance of, if people have symptoms of coronavirus, then the importance of self-isolating to help reduce and delay uh, the spread of the virus. So it's really important as we take these decisions, uh, as we uh, take these steps, that we set out very clearly for the public um, the, the advice and what it is we're asking them to do. And we've all got a part to play in that. Of course, um, I, I should remember to say, as I, I do in all of these occasions, that even although we move from contain into delay, the general advice to the public about hand washing, about personal hygiene remains as valid as ever. And in all these things, I think we can all play a part in making sure the public uh, have the answers, the guidance and the support that they are going to need in the weeks to come. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to take some... Constituency questions, I suspect we'll return to this subject, but constituency questions first. Kenneth Gibson, uh, Kenneth Gibson first. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, Anne in my constituency has, like much of Scotland, been buffeted by storms in recent weeks, leading to numerous unavoidable cancellations of the I island's lifeline ferry service. However, what has caused upset, anger and frustration to boil up amongst islanders are technical problems which have, been hugely, which have hugely worsened an already difficult situation. In the last week alone, the 27-year-old Caledonian Isles has had problems with its bow doors, mezzanine decks and a mooring winch gearbox. So many cancellations mean islanders cannot get to hospital for chemotherapy and elective operations. Hotels and tourist businesses are losing custom and some may go out of business. Six weeks of further disruption is expected, including over Easter. Given this ongoing crisis, what assurances can the First Minister give? that additional ferry cover will be provided to Arne throughout that period and beyond, and when will a long-term, often-promised, comprehensive ferry replacement programme to renew a rapidly ageing fleet be put in place? First Minister. Well, can I thank Kerry Gibson for uh, that question? It is clearly a matter of great regret that passengers using the Kia Drossen to Brodick service are facing uh, disruption, and I absolutely understand the frustration. Uh, while the vessel uh, on the route, the MV Caledonian Isles, continues in service, it does so with operating restrictions, the master assessed the situation and introduced a wind speed limit restriction. CalMac has sourced a supplier with the replacement parts in stock, which will minimise the time frame for repair to approximately seven days. In response to the disruption, CalMac are providing additional sailings uh, on another uh, route. Transport Scotland is currently working with CMAL and CalMac to develop investment programmes for small and major vessels with the aim of increased fleet standardisation, taking account of the many and varied routes that CalMac serves. Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister will know, by 2022, 88,000 cars will use Edinburgh City Bypass, many of these passing through Sheriff Hall Roundabout. Sheriff Hall provides the main route for many Borders and Midlothian residents to access the capital and forms a key access for public transport and the Edinburgh and South East City deal. In 2017, a much-needed flyover was announced, welcomed by many in the south of Scotland, now we learn that this may be delayed following budget discussions. Can the First Minister confirm that the flyover will go ahead and clarify how long any period of delay will last? First Minister. Well, I, I understand the point that the member is making. Indeed, it's a point that's made by uh, people on my own benches, given the congestion that is, uh, naming nobody in particular, uh, given the congestion that is uh, suffered there. Um, as we announced uh, in the budget, we uh, are mindful of the points that have been made, but we are also mindful of our uh, responsibilities to ensure that everything we do now is also consistent with our climate change responsibilities, which is why, uh, as part of the budget, we confirmed that we would engage with local partners to seek uh, their agreement to undertake a review of the scheme and its compatibility with their environmental obligations. Um, but we would only proceed with any changes if they can be agreed with local city deal partners. So we will keep uh, Parliament updated uh, on that, uh, particularly those members who have a constituency interest in it. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Sir David Norgrove, the chair of the UK Statistics Authority, has today expressed concern 
about the selective use of unpublished data by Transport Scotland in a news release on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route last month. Does the First Minister agree with Sir David that Transport Scotland must act in line with the Code of Practice for Statistics, which applies to all producers of official statistics, and will she urge them accordingly to publish all the data in question without further delay? First Minister. Um, I, I hope Lewis MacDonald will forgive me. I have. Uh, I hope you will understand, spend the morning engaged in discussions about tackling coronavirus. I uh, have not had the opportunity to catch up with the, the statement that uh, he refers to. I will undertake to do that this afternoon and come back to him in detail about it. Thank you very much. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Balhousie Care Group have asked non-essential visitors not to visit their homes. It does beg the question about our approach to people who are cared for in their own home. If the symptoms of the virus don't show until some time later, what is the advice? How has the government evaluated the risks of visiting elderly and vulnerable neighbours? And how will isolated people with no family support get help when the peak of the virus hits home? First Minister. Uh, well, I thank Willie Rennie for raising what are also important issues. Can I uh, say as a general matter, I'm sure members understand that there are a number of these issues, they are all important and we are seeking to work through them um, on the basis of the best advice. The advice uh, to people right now about when they should seek advice and testing is clear, that advice is likely to change. The issues around care homes, which have been raised with me uh, directly and I know raised with the Health Secretary, uh, Scottish Government officials and Health Protection Scotland are looking right now at the advice that will be provided to the care home sector on all of these issues and we'll make sure uh, that MSPs uh, are provided with uh, information about that uh, as soon as possible. Really ready. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's a very helpful answer and I th think they are very difficult issues and I think everybody in the chamber will try to help get clarity um, on exactly what is required and advised. Um, as there is limited intensive treatment unit capacity, how is the government going to create enough isolation spaces for the predicted numbers of patients who need respiratory support and where will those spaces be? It has been suggested that options could include clearing wards with lots of single rooms, stopping elective operations and using theatres for isolation support. The new neuroscience building at the new Children's Hospital in Edinburgh has capacity for, I understand, 70 beds. What obstacles are there to using that building and can they be overcome in the next few weeks before the peak of this outbreak hits? First Minister. Uh, well, just before I come on to answer that question, uh, more generally on the uh, specific point there about the new hospital in Edinburgh and neurosurgery facilities, that is being looked at uh, right now. Obviously, we have to make sure that using any facilities would be safe to do, but we want to make sure that we are able to utilise all capacity that can be used uh, within the National Health Service. In terms of uh, ITU uh, capacity, I think the Health Secretary said this in her statement uh, earlier this week. She will give further details in her update next Tuesday uh, to Parliament, but we are seeking to double the provision of intensive care capacity um, that will involve using uh, different facilities uh, within hospitals, theatre facilities, uh, for example, and all of that is uh, being progressed right now as part of the implementation plan to scale up NHS uh, resources. Uh, there will uh, inevitably, and I, I want to be very clear about this, although we will provide uh, more detail uh, as we go along here, there will inevitably be an impact, and I would anticipate a significant impact on non-urgent elective uh, procedures within the National Health Service, but it is important that we set out that properly uh, once the planning has been done. That planning is underway very intensively right now so that we uh, are doing everything we can to increase intensive care capacity, but also uh, expand general hospital capacity and the number of hospital beds that are available. And the Health Secretary will be able to give uh, more information about that when she further updates Parliament at the start of next week. Thank you. We have some further supplementary questions. First, Jackie Bailey to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Constituents with cystic fibrosis have significantly reduced lung function and will experience severe consequences as a result of coronavirus. Some are self-isolating already, but others still remain at work. 
Um, I have become more concerned since a local GP contacted me this morning, urging the Scottish Government to act now and institute isolation measures across the population. He strongly believes that the true extent of the virus is much more widespread than those who have been tested and that, I quote, every extra 24 hours that we leave it now will mean more deaths in two weeks' time. So can I therefore urge the First Minister not to wait until next week and ask her to accelerate action in order to protect the population? First Minister. Um, well, I, I'm grateful to Jack, Jackie Bailey for raising this issue. I am acutely aware of the importance and the urgency of these issues, but I, I know Jackie Bailey will understand. I, I am not a clinician, and therefore for all of us in positions like mine, it is important that we do listen to and are guided and informed by the, the, the advice and the expertise of those uh, who are best placed to give it. I have uh, discussed the issue uh, on many occasions, but most recently this morning with the Chief Medical Officer of uh, those people who have other underlying health conditions. The four Chief Medical Officers uh, of the UK are uh, looking at this now in terms of very quickly being able to give uh, very specific advice to those uh, who have uh, specific conditions, and there are potentially a large number of conditions that will be uh, involved there. As I said earlier on, uh, there is existing guidance for people who have severely uh, compromised immune systems, and that should be followed. But I want to be uh, very clear to Jackie Bailey and to the Chamber, these issues are being treated very urgently, and uh, that is not just true of the government, but of our uh, medical advisors as well. But it is important that we are giving people the right advice. The kind of behaviour changes we are going to ask people to undertake uh, may not simply be for a couple of weeks. This is something that will be in place for a potentially significant number of weeks, a significant period of time. It's important that that advice is right. It is important that people can rely on it. Uh, and it is important that it is absolutely informed by those who know uh, what the right thing to do is. So it is being treated urgently. Um, and uh, I will continue, as the Health Secretary will, to have these discussions uh, on a regular basis. Andy Whiteman to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you. The First Minister made important points about the resilience of frontline workers earlier. I have a constituent who runs a day nursery and their insurers are not adding COVID-19 to a list of notifiable diseases, leaving the nursery potentially uninsured, having to lay off staff and to close. Is this the kind of issue the Scottish Government is aware of and can ministers provide any advice or support given the important role of nursery provision to the wider workforce? First Minister. Hey. Yes, we are aware uh, of issues relating to insurance, not just in uh, daycare nurseries, nurseries, but more generally it is an issue the Scottish Government um, and, and indeed the UK Government will be uh, intending to uh, try to get further clarity on and of course uh, encouraging insurance companies as we will encourage businesses to be as flexible as possible. Um, and again, this is an issue we will uh, endeavour to keep uh, members across the Chamber updated on. Daniel Johnson. The precedent of school closures in response to COVID-19 in other countries and most recently Ireland will naturally concern school pupils planning to take exams after the Easter holiday. So can I ask what communication the Scottish Government has had with the Scottish Qualifications Authority and what contingencies are in place should this year's exam diet be impacted by potential restrictions and disruptions as a result of the pandemic? First Minister. Uh, the Deputy First Minister has had already uh, extensive discussions uh, with the SQA and these discussions will continue. There is work uh, underway as there is across a whole range of our responsibilities to put in place sensible contingency plans uh, and that work will uh, develop in the days to come. It is not the advice uh, here right now that schools uh, or colleges or universities should be closed. I said earlier on we must keep that uh, under review. Uh, the advice, and I'm, I'm summarising and generalising here in the interest of time, but uh, in relation to schools in particular, uh, some of the advice relates to uh, if schools are closed, then children will inevitably uh, gather together in less formal settings, which may actually be more of a risk in terms of infection spread than being in schools encouraged to use proper hand hygiene practices. So that's the advice right now, but we will continue to keep all of these things under review, uh, informed, of course, by uh, the experts that we're seeking advice from. And Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I should declare an interest as a member of the Justice for McGrathy campaign. Does the First Minister agree with me that the referral by the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission of the conviction of Abdel Basset al McGrathy back for appeal to the High Court on the grounds of unreasonable verdict and non-disclosure of evidence by the Crown will at long last, after decades, allow the court process in Scotland to be exhausted, whatever the outcome of that appeal? First Minister. 
Uh, well, can I say, uh, firstly, that my thoughts are uh, very much with those who lost loved ones on that uh, dreadful evening more than 30 years ago. I think the strength and compassion uh, that they have shown has created a, a legacy of friendship and ensured that the memory of those who died uh, will live on. Uh, the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, of course, play a critical role as part of the checks and balances in our justice system. Uh, they have completed a comprehensive investigation and decided it appropriate to refer the conviction of Al Megrahi back to court. Uh, the member will, of course, appreciate that the Scottish Government will not comment on the specifics of the case. It will be up now to Mr Megrahi's family to decide how to take forward the appeal. Uh, but I have every confidence in Scotland's justice system in dealing with the case. We've always been clear that Al Megrahi was convicted in a court of law and that a court of law is now and always has been the only appropriate forum for determining his guilt or innocence. In that uh, respect, I think I do uh, agree with Christine Graham. Thank you very much. Question number four, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the UK budget. First Minister. Uh, we were pleased to see the UK budget respond to the economic impact of coronavirus, uh, which is one of the most important challenges facing both the Scottish Government and the UK Government, uh, although, as I've said already, we don't yet have clarity on exactly what that means for Scotland. Uh, the Barnet consequentials otherwise announced in the UK budget are in line with the assumptions that underpinned the Scottish budget and budget bill passed by the Scottish Parliament last week. Uh, while this is welcome, and it is welcome, our resources budget is still, of course, lower in real terms than it was at the start of the decade in 2010-11. Bruce Crawford. I thank the First Minister for her answer. Does the First Minister agree with me that the coronavirus emergency will be the most challenging situation for the people in Scotland since the establishment of this Parliament? In his budget statement yesterday, the Chancellor announced a number of measures in response to the emergency. In regard to the £5 billion emergency response fund, for the NHS and the public services, which is very welcome. What consultation has the UK Government had with devolved governments in regard to this fund? What discussions have taken place about how this fund will be allocated? How soon will the money from this fund find its way into the NHS? And does the First Minister agree with me that this money needs to get into the NHS as early as possible to help to protect and care for people in Scotland who are very deeply concerned about the impact of the coronavirus? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree very much with Bruce Crawford that it is important that we get this money to where it is needed most as quickly uh, as possible. Um, in answer to his specific questions, I'm not aware of any prior engagement with the devolved administrations on the £5 billion emergency fund. As I've said earlier on, uh, we have uh, not yet received confirmation on the associated funding for Scotland. And I would repeat, this is not a criticism. Uh, governments across the UK are incredibly busy at working to address uh, this situation. We have been liaising with the Treasury to secure assurances on the funding implications for Scotland and uh, clearly the position does need to be resolved urgently. Um, I'm very clear uh, that all exceptional consequentials related to coronavirus will be spent to protect individuals, our public services and wider society. Donald Cameron. Thank you. And in a similar vein, yesterday's budget, as others have noted, announced a significant package in relation to coronavirus and business. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce have spoken about the urgent need to invest extra funds into business support and boosting the economy. Does the First Minister acknowledge the need for rapid assistance to business? And even if there is some uncertainty around the precise figures, can she give any details of what type of support will be given to business and workers in these circumstances? First Minister. Well, I've already given a commitment today which I hope is a welcome one that every penny of these consequentials that are intended for business will go to business and uh, we will look at the specific needs of business we'll have some discussions uh, with the business community about what is best but broadly speaking the types of support that was announced yesterday in the budget would be the support that we would want to see uh, replicated here in Scotland uh, we may have some differences depending on the views uh, of businesses and uh, the circumstances that we face here I want to be in a position of giving greater uh, clarity on this as quickly as possible I I cannot give the clarity that I don't have from uh, the Treasury. Um, I hope that clarity comes soon. I have no reason to expect that it won't. Uh, and when it does, we will pass that on uh, to those uh, involved. Uh, I do think uh, we need to see more action, both from the UK Government and indeed from the Scottish Government, to help individuals as well as businesses. And as I, I think I've said previously in today's session, we are also looking uh, within our own uh, resources at what uh, additional steps we can take to provide help, particularly for uh, vulnerable people. And, uh, these will be amongst the many matters that we keep Parliament updated on in the weeks to come. Question number five, Peter Chapman. 
I thank you, Providing Officer. To ask the First Minister for, for what reason the Bill of Scott Rail and Serco are to be giving, given a report at £103 million in additional public funding despite not meeting their targets. First Minister. The Abellio, Scott Rail and Serco Caledonian Sleeper forecasted payments for next year are in line with both current franchise agreements. These are contracted amounts between the Scottish Government and the franchisees. Uh, the increase in franchise payments take account of many factors, uh, not least that we are funding 9% more Scott Rail services compared with the start of the franchise and that the payments include changes to track access charges to the nationalised network rail determined by the Independent Office of Rail and Road. The Scottish Government is still required to use the flawed franchise system because previous UK governments have failed to reform the structure of the railway industry. The conclusions of the Williams Review of the Railway Industry promised for autumn 2019 uh, are still awaited. Peter Chapman. I thank the First Minister for her answer. However, I note that this 103 million equates to a 25% increase in subsidies compared to last year to a very substantial £520 million. Fair prices up, delays up and cancellations up. It seems mind-boggling that a company can be rewarded so lucratively for failing to deliver its core service. <coughs> Presiding officer, in the wake of the ferries fiasco and the Edinburgh Sick Kids Hospital debacle, that are costing the taxpayer hundreds of millions. It seems that every contract this SNP government signs, the taxpayer has to foot the bill. Isn't this just a further example of another incompetent contract the Scottish Government seems to be so adept at signing? First Minister. Uh, no, is the, the short answer. Look, um, the characterisation of this by the member is just downright wrong and you know, it fails to take account of some of the factors that I set out in my initial answer uh, that lie behind uh, this increase in payment. I'll repeat some of them again. 9% more Scott Rail services that we are funding compared to the start of the franchise. And of course, the uh, changes to track access charges that are not determined by us, but by the independent ORR, the Office of Rail and Road. Uh, so these are uh, just hard facts that lie behind this rather than uh, the reasons that the member put forward. But, you know, I say again, I don't think the current franchise system is ideal, far from it. I think it is deeply flawed. We've argued for it to be changed for a long time. And uh, previously, Labour UK governments and more recently, Tory uh, UK governments have dragged their feet on that. So perhaps we uh, would be better uh, to hear Tories argue for some of the fundamental reform that we need to see uh, and get to the source of this problem rather than standing up here mischaracterising it in this parliament. Question number six, Colleen McNeill. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to comments by Scottish Women's Aid that victims of domestic violence face being put on waiting lists of up to six months before they can access services. First Minister. Uh, well, there are uh, still far too many people who experience domestic abuse uh, and uh, they should not have to wait to receive support. Uh, we, as a government, are looking very actively at this issue. The Minister for Older People and Equalities visited Dundee Women's Aid on Tuesday of this week where she heard about the impact of domestic abuse and the role of frontline services in aiding women and children's recovery. Uh, last month, we opened our new £13 million delivering equally safe fund for applications, uh, and that fund is there to specifically support organisations involved in this work. In addition, alongside COSLA, we are reviewing how these services are funded in future uh, because we all want those experiencing the pernicious harm of domestic abuse to have access to the support that they need and to have access to that support when they need it. Thank you for that answer. Um, the First Minister will be aware there were 60,000 incidents of domestic abuse last year and it's a rise of 2%. But Scottish Women's Aid supports more than 1,000 women and children across the country on any given day. The vast majority of those women's aid groups operate waiting lists of up to six months and half of those services are forced to operate a waiting list for refuge spaces. And the First Minister I know is only too aware that that's women and children fleeing from their own homes to be safe. I'm pleased that the First Minister has said that there will be a review of the funding. And this Parliament, both Labour and the SNP, have a good record, I think, on domestic violence issues. And in view of that, would the First Minister be willing to consider, and of course the Minister, Christina McHale, be setting up an emergency fund as part of that review to help eliminate waiting times, but to focus on the refuge services to help women fleeing violence? Minister. Um, I'm always happy to consider uh, suggestions that are made, although we have, of course, just finalised uh, 
the budget uh, for next year. I, I've also, as I said in my answer, we have just recently opened uh, the Delivering Equally Safe Fund for applications. That is £13 million that will be available to uh, organisations tackling violence against women and girls. But of course, we will continue to consider this uh, on an ongoing basis. Can I uh, pay tribute, uh, heartfelt tribute, to the work of Women's Aid uh, and other organisations in this field? I want to make sure that their services are available to women who need them when they need them. Uh, we, uh, since 2015, have invested over £80 million in work to tackle violence against women and girls. Um, our equally uh, safe fund is allocated in this financial year about to end uh, already around £4.7 million to local women's aid organisations across Scotland. So there is, I, I think, evidence of strong commitment there. And, in fairness, Pauline McNeill recognised that, but I absolutely recognise uh, that there is more work to be done here. It's an issue I am personally very committed to making sure uh, that we see further progress on, and uh, I'm more than happy to take the suggestion away for consideration. Thank you very much. Apologies, to, there's quite a few members didn't get in today in supplementary questions, but we have no more time. I'm afraid that concludes First Minister's questions. Oh, point of order on Asarwa. Presenting officer, thank you for taking the point of order. I want to be very clear that this point of order is not a criticism of the First Minister, uh, the Health Secretary, business managers, or indeed the presiding officer. Um, uh, we all accept the seriousness of the coronavirus and the implications it has for our constituents. I'm sure all members will have received communications uh, with people who have concerns around the coronavirus. I think there are a number of questions that members would probably legitimately want to raise uh, with either the First Minister or with the Cabinet Secretary for Health. And I know that both the Health Secretary and the First Minister will want to answer those questions as best as possible uh, in this chamber. Will there be an opportunity to have those questions raised uh, in this chamber? Because just one practical example, uh, I've been uh, communicated with, with a group of 150 GPs uh, from the west of Scotland covering Glasgow, uh, Lanarkshire and Renfrewshire, who are saying that despite promises of receiving protective equipment and materials to their GP practices to help protect those that will deliver our primary care, no such equipment apart from paper masks has yet been received. I know that's something that would be of concern to both the First Minister and the uh, Health Secretary. So issues like that, I think, are legitimate concerns that members would wish to raise concerning the significance of the coronavirus. I, I seek your guidance on what opportunity there may be to raise those concerns. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Sauer. Can I say thank you for that important point. We did change business. There was a, a statement scheduled for this afternoon and uh, unfortunately we had to change business at the very last minute when we came into the chamber at 11.40. The main reason for that is that the COBRA meeting this afternoon, as I understand it, has been delayed. Um, I recognise there is a huge amount of interest. I made that point myself when we started business. I tried to take as many questions on this subject at FMQs and the First Minister and the leaders also uh, similarly addressed this issue. Um, I suggested uh, as we started business, that the business managers and the chamber team get together over lunchtime just to discuss whether it is possible to add, uh, for example, an emergency statement at the end of the day today. I noticed the Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman, was actually nodding in agreement at that point. However, I'm also aware that the government is not in charge of the timetable and the COBRA meeting might go on indefinitely. Um, the First Minister, I could see, also was indicating wishing to add something there, First Minister. President Officer, I'm at uh, the service of, of the Parliament, as is the Health Secretary. We don't know how long the COBRA meeting uh, will last this afternoon, but we'd be happy to come back to the Chamber later on. But more generally than that, the, the specific issue that Anasar were raised, we are aware of um, and uh, are already following up. Any issues that members are having raised with them, they should feel free to come to us immediately and we will follow up uh, as best we can. And in terms of uh, presence in the Parliament, that's for the, the Business Bureau, of course, to decide. Uh, but the Health Secretary and I uh, will make ourselves available as uh, flexibly as possible to answer as many questions. Indeed, the Health Secretary is happy to speak to any members uh, of the Chamber outside the, the, the meetings of the Parliament as well. Can I thank the First Minister for that response? Just conscious that the health, we don't want to keep the Health Minister away from the COBRA meeting to, uh, when, when that's possible. However, we'll consider this over lunchtime and we'll come back to the Chamber with information. Now, we're going to move on shortly to a members' business debate in the name of Jamie Halker Johnson, but uh, there's a number of members, uh, ministers, and the public gallery which will need to change seats. So we're going to have a short suspension, just a short suspension, uh, before we move on to members' business.